Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Had a, had a great message this morning. Looking forward to hearing Brother Spencer tonight. We're going to go ahead and start off with number 483, Footsteps of Jesus. And we're going to sing three verses tonight. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. So we invite you to join in. And let's go ahead and stand together as we sing our opening hymn. You may be seated this evening. Uh, it is a privilege to gather once again to be in the house of the Lord to uh, sing his praises, uh, worship his holy name, and uh, grateful that we have the opportunity to do that this evening. I don't know about you, I ate a little too much at lunch, and uh, we're still struggling with that, but no, I tell you, it's, uh, it's always great to be able to fellowship with one another and, uh, and to gather in worship. I'm going to invite you, if you will, as we enter this time of worship, uh, if you will, let's join our hearts and our minds in unity in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that as we assemble to worship this evening, uh, Father, that our hearts and our minds are in one accord, and that is uh, in unity with you. Uh, Father, we pray that our worship tonight, it would be all about you, it would glorify you, uh, but Father, that it would refresh us, it would renew us. Uh, because, Father, there is nothing quite like worshiping in your presence. Uh, Father, we pray that as we hear your word tonight, sung through these wonderful and marvelous hymns of the faith, and also through the proclamation of your word, Father, we pray uh, that you would convict us, that you would encourage us, but, Father, that you would invigorate us, uh, Father, that we might be able to... Uh, fulfill your calling which you've placed upon our life well. Uh, Father, that we would fulfill the great commission because of the great commandment. And that, Father, we would, until you come, be prepared, be ready, be waiting, and be expectant as we continue to serve you faithfully, wholeheartedly, and abundantly. Father, bless this time of worship. Bless Brother Randall as he leads us. Bless your word as it's brought forth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Brother Randall. Next hymn is number 15, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Songs of loudest praise. Teach me some. 
fixed upon it, out of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God of love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. <coughs> well, amen. Thank you, Brother Randall. Come thou fount of every blessing. It's one of my favorite hymns. I don't know about you. Interesting story behind that hymn about the gentleman who wrote it. Although he did, he was prone to wonder and although he wandered from the faith. Uh, what a great hymn of the faith that is. I want you to take your Bibles tonight. We're going to be in the Gospel according to Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 24 this evening. And as we're turning there, I want you to think of a couple scenarios with me. You know, we're continuing our series, Tracing the Rainbow uh, Through the Rain, Finding Hope, Discovering Hope Through Life's Problems. And I want you to visualize just a couple of scenes with me. You may can find yourself injected into these two scenes. A Christian couple is at home, they're going through the bills, and the couple ordinarily has a smooth sailing marriage. Uh, things are going well, they know how to communicate, they know how to love one another, they're faithful in their church, they're serving the Lord, yet as they're looking through the bills and they find there's a whole lot more month left at the end of the month than there is money, they're out of money. And they begin to get frustrated. And they begin to argue with one another. And, they, and tensions rise and one makes a cutting remark about the other's spending. And then soon they're at odds with one another. They're arguing, they're fighting, they're bickering. One lashes out and out of impulsive behavior says something hurtful to the other person. For you married folks here today, I know not of what I speak, but for you married folks today, I'm sure that has happened at least a handful of times in your marriage. Uh, there are times where impulsive behavior, when frustration just sometimes gets the best of us. Uh, when we say things we don't mean, when we lash out out of, uh, out, of, out of anger, when we lash out out of frustration, impulsive behavior. Uh, I want you to think about Ron. Ron is a faithful deacon in his Baptist church. He's served the Lord for many years. He's been faithful. He's been at all the meetings. You could probably count on one hand over the last 25 years that Ron has missed church. He's been faithful to minister to people. He's been faithful to help lead the church. He's been faithful to his pastor. And Ron is on his way from church coming home from work. They're having a business meeting. And as Ron is driving, he has a tailgater on the back of his car. He follows him for several miles, and Ron begins to get frustrated. And out of anger, he says, why won't this idiot just get past me? As the, as the gentleman comes from behind him and passes Ron, he yells some loud obscenities, tells Ron he's number one by using sign language. And as Ron looks, rolls down his window, he yells, you stupid idiot, learn how to drive. Can you relate to that impulsive behavior. You see, everyone, every Christian, if you've lived long enough, if you've lived this past week, out of impulsive behavior, you've said something in error. You've said something brash. You've said something you likely didn't mean. Impulsive behavior is something that every Christian, regardless of how long they've served the Lord, how faithful they are to the Lord, how faithful they are to His mission, and how faithful they are to His church, every Christian struggles with impulsive behavior. But why does a couple get stressed at one another and exchange words? Why does Ron lash out at the guy who's tailgating behind him? Why is there impulsive behavior? Why do I do what I do is an age-old question. The Apostle Paul struggled with the same thing. He struggled with impulsive behavior because what he wanted to do, 
He didn't do. But what he didn't want to do, that is what he did. Because genuine followers of Jesus Christ, why is it that we speak, think, and act inconsistently with the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, Paul, the man who had written 11 books in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, the same man who was the superlative missionary who brought many, many people and made them wise unto salvation. Paul, the Christian martyr who was crucified, his head was on a chopping block and he died because of the gospel, because he was bold in his Christian faith. It was Paul that said in Romans chapter 7 verse 19, for the good that I would, I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, that is what I do. I wonder how many times in your Christian life you have been frustrated at yourself. Haven't you been frustrated at yourself? Uh, sometimes when I pause to think, I, I'll, go, I'll say something and I'll go home and think to myself, why in the world did you say that? Uh, there are some times where I find my foot is in my mouth more than I'd like to admit. I think if we're all being honest, our foot finds itself in our mouths a little more than we'd like to admit. But why is it that we do what we do? Uh, why is it that impulsive behavior gets the best of us? Why is it that we can relate with Paul and say, that which I want to do, I don't perform, but that which I'd like to perform, I do not in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes to the root of the matter. He begins to deal with our entire being. He deals with our affections, which is the state of the heart. He deals with our attitudes, which is the mind. And he deals with our actions, and that is the human will. You see, my friend, there is a chain reaction in that our affection, I want you to listen to this, our affection affects our attitudes, and our attitudes obviously affect our actions. You see, what we do is determined by what we think. And how we think is determined by where our heart, our affections are. You see, before the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, the proper order of decision making, it was first in the mind, and then it became to the emotions, and then it was acted upon in the will. But you see, because of Genesis chapter 3, because of the lust of the flesh, because of the lust of the eyes, because of the pride of life, the chain of command has changed. The chain of action and reaction has totally changed. And instead of thinking about things and praying over things, a lot of us act out of emotion. You see, Satan doesn't appeal to our mind. Satan appeals to our emotion. Uh, if Satan can manipulate our emotions, he can attack the mind. Uh, if Satan can manipulate your mind, he'd struggle with your emotions. Why is it that I do what I do? It's because I'm a sinner. Although I'm a saved sinner, I too often make decisions beginning with the heart instead of with the head. So I want to put it this way, and then there are three things I want to discuss. You see, our admiration guides our affection. Our affection governs our attitude, and our attitude guarantees our action. Why do we do what we do? Why does impulsive behavior exist? Three things I want you to note. Number one, I want you to note that our admiration guides our affection. Our admiration guides our affection. Dealing with the heart. Look, if you will, at verse 19. I want you to look at your Bibles. Verse 19 in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19. And he says these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, you ought to underline this verse, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, admiration involves thinking highly of a person or an object or thing. It implies that we would exalt the person or object that's admired. And my friend, the wrong kind of admiration turns into idolatry. We talked that, about that a little today. Uh, that anything that we put ahead or before Jesus Christ is considered idolatry. Anything that would take precedence in our life over the worship and the love and the desire to serve Jesus Christ is idolatry. And so as Jesus is on the, on, in the Sermon on the Mount, as we read about Jesus, and we read about what he's talking about with our admirations, our admirations can easily become idols. 
Jesus expressed that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, a person's treasure is what they admire. In 1 John, we read these words. John, the beloved apostle, writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. You see, when Eve was in the Garden of Eden, if you think back with me, Genesis chapter 3, it's one of my favorite chapters because it's one of the most examined and it's one of the most crucial to understand as a Christian. In Genesis chapter 3, as Eve was in the Garden of Eden, as she had experienced uh, the splendors of God, she was in the paradise of God, and all was well and wonderful. You can't say that every life is sunshine and roses, but before their big mess up, it was sunshine and roses. Didn't have a care in the world. They were basking in the provision of God, except they disobeyed God's one command to them. Uh, Isn't it kind of funny that humans often think they know better than God? Uh, Isn't it kind of strange that humans seem to try to transcend the will of God? Uh, But my friend, God is is made of infinite wisdom. Uh, God does possess all knowledge. God is all loving, but there is judgment, and certainly God judged them in Genesis chapter 3. But in Genesis chapter 3, all Eve did was admiringly glance at what the serpent offered in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because her admiration guided her affection. Satan began to pluck pluck the heartstrings of Eve with his appeal. It started in her heart, then her affection began to govern her attitude, and the temptation worked into her mind, and finally, her attitude, it guaranteed her action. And it was no surprise that she ultimately accepted. It also happened in the heart and life of David. David was a man after God's own heart, but unfortunately, David was also a man whose heart was prone to wonder. Uh, David was a faithful man. David tried to serve God, but boy, David made some bad decisions. Uh, We read in several Psalms that David lamented over this decision. It's one of the saddest decisions of moral failure that David ever made. But you see, the problem with David was his admiration of Bathsheba guided his affection, and his affection governed his attitude. What was born in his heart, it trickled down into his mind because of admiration determines affection. You know, some people will tell you today, I'm sure you've used this. If you've used this, we'll offer a moment in just a moment, you can repent of it. Never the worst advice you can ever give in life, the worst advice, you want to know what it is? Follow your heart. If somebody ever tells you follow your heart, you just tune that out. Following your heart is the biggest disaster you can ever make in your life. Uh, you, follow, you follow your heart and it's not going to end well. Why? Because the heart above all is desperately wicked. Uh, you follow your heart and you're going to go into the wrong places. You follow God, you'll be right every time. Why? Because God is one of wisdom. The heart is something of wickedness. And you and I have to understand the consequences that our ad, the admiration of a sinful heart determines our affection, the thing that we love. You love the world, and you admire the world, and you have affection. It's going to determine your course of life. It's going to determine your actions. You love the things of God. You admire the things of God. You admire His service. It's going to determine your affection, which is going to determine your action. It sounds philosophical, but it's true. It simply comes down to this. Where is your admiration? What do you admire in life? Do you admire the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes? Or do you admire the things of God, the things of the Spirit, the things of Christ-likeness? What is it that you admire in life? In Mark chapter 8, we read some interesting words. Uh, the, the great man, Mark, the great disciple, he wrote these words in chapter 8, and it, it tells the account of Jesus and the rich young ruler. And Jesus said these words. He said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give 
in exchange for his own soul. What would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Lou Sarrett wrote of these preoccupied with material possessions. She wrote these words. To him, the moon was a silver dollar spun into the sky by some mysterious hand. The sun was a gleaming golden coin, his to purloin. The fleshly minted stars were dimes of delight flung out upon the corner of the night. In yonder room he lies with pennies on his eyes. Those, that's the definition of someone who's caught up with himself. They're caught up with their life. They've got the wrong they're admiring the wrong things. What does Jesus say in verse 19? He says in, he says in verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's kind of a sad picture. It's basically the picture of a financial person who has a lot of money and he invests in the wrong stock. Uh, some of you people that deal with stocks, I like stocks. I like financing. Uh, I like to play with stocks. I do a little day trading myself. I, I don't have a ton of money in it, but apart from my retirement account, sometimes I just like to play the stock market. I don't think it's gambling, but if it is, we'll, I'll confess of it and repent and we won't do it. But I do play the stock market for investing, uh, for investing purposes. I don't believe it. So anyway, as I'm investing, the goal is you want to invest in the right stock. Uh, you don't want to invest in the wrong stock, lose all your money, and say, well, that was a waste of time. And so what do you do? You research, and you make the right decision. But this is really a sad picture about an investor who, it, who stores up, lays up treasures in the wrong place and loses it all. But Jesus offers something else. Look at what he says there in verse 20. But store up for yourselves treasures... In heaven, put your stock in the right place where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. What was it that the Apostle Paul said? He says, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Uh, the great thing about salvation the great thing about God, the great thing about serving Him is that everything we entrust God with is sealed and secured until that day. Because our admiration determines our affection. But there's a second thing. Not only does our admiration determine our affection, but secondly, I want you to notice that our affection governs our attitude. Look at verses 22 and 23, if you will. Our affections determine our attitude. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then is your, in, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Verse 23, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Basically, he's talking about someone who has spiritual cataracts. If you've ever had cataracts, you know that you can't see very clearly. Uh, it affects people in different ways. Sometimes it blurry. Sometimes you can't really see at all. Sometimes you can see, but just not very well. It's spiritual cataracts. It's a spiritual issue. It is something that is placed over their eyes. Often we talk about in the Scriptures scales that were over their eyes. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he had met the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, he was temporarily blinded by the Lord Jesus Christ. Ananias had to come and lead Paul all over the place. What a humbling experience for the man who was highly esteemed by the Jews. Now converted, now following Christ, what a humbling experience. You see, the problem is a lot of people live life not realizing that their affection governs their attitudes. You see, our admiration guides our affection, then our affection governs our attitude because sin blinds the minds of the unsaved. It dims the vision of the saved. Don't you get the idea that just because you're saved that sin has no effect? Uh, there's a lot of people who go through life saying, well, if I sin, I know that God's going to forgive me. Uh, if I sin, I know that I can just ask for the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you, just as it happened in the heart of David, so it can happen in the heart of any Christian, that if David was a man after God's own heart and David's vision was dimmed by his sin, so such is the case with any believer. After God's own heart, when sin plagues the heart of a Christian, why? Because affection governs attitudes. 
You know, as a pastor, I've conducted a lot of funerals. I've been in processions in front of a lot of hearses. And the old, as Denzel Washington said, I believe it was Denzel Washington. Some of you history folks will have to correct me. If it was Denzel Washington, he said in one of his baccalaureate speeches, I've never seen a U-Haul attached to a hearse. I've seen a lot of very wealthy people die. I've seen a lot of very poor people die. You know what the end result was? They died. Uh, where their treasure was after they died uh, could be found. Uh, your treasure is either in the wrong place, and I'm just going to warn you, it's probably going to be pretty hot where you are, uh, or your treasure's in the right place where you've made the right decisions, where you've made the right investments, spiritual investments. And all that seems to happen in life just seems to fade away. There was a great Methodist bishop one time. He was one of the leaders of the faith uh, many, many years ago. His name was Bishop Ralph Spalding Cushman. Ralph Spalding Cushman was a well-esteemed Methodist bishop. He had led one of the one great spiritual move of God, and he was very esteemed among religious leaders. He was in a great position of prominence. People would have looked at him and said, we'll put him in the same category as the Apostle Paul. This man's got it figured out. Except he battled personal problems because his son, Jim, who was a faithful missionary on the mission field, uh, died in his late 20s, early 30s. Uh, Bishop Ralph Spalding Cushman uh, dealt with anger. He dealt with impulsive behavior because he just couldn't understand why God would take his son at such a young age after he was faithfully serving the Lord in one of the most dangerous countries at the time. Ralph Spalding Cushman dealt with these things and until he found and after he had sought after degrees and after he had run through life impressing people and faithfully preaching and preaching really for the applause of men rather than the uh, commendation of God, he finally realized that the Spirit of God convicted him. He wrote these words about his life. And he said, I counted dollars while God counted crosses. I counted gains while... He counted losses. I counted my worth by the things gained in store, but he sized me up by the scars that I bore. I counted honors and sought for degrees. He wept as he counted the hours on my knees. And I never knew till one day at a grave how vain are these things we spend our whole life to save. I did not yet know till Jim went above that richest is he who is rich. In God's love. You see, what one does is determined by what one thinks. And what one thinks is determined by where one's heart is. Our admiration guides our affection. Our affection governs our attitude. There's one final thing I want to mention. Not only does our admiration guide our affection, not only does our affection determine our attitude, but finally our attitude guarantees our action. Our attitude guarantees our action. Look at the final verse there, verse 24. Look at verse 24 in chapter 6. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Underline this, these words right here. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot serve God and wealth. You can inject a lot of those things in that you're, if you have a King James Bible, it may say mammon there. Uh, you cannot serve God in mammon. Uh, most theologians will agree, and I agree with their interpretation, that mammon uh, was a personification of wealth. Uh, that mammon was thought to be the God in, their, in this time, in this time period of culture. He was thought to be the God of wealth uh, by people in secular or other religious cultures. But you see, you, you either, there's two gods. There's the God of mammon, there's the God of wealth, there's the God of the world, the God of things, the God of constructs, or there's the God that we serve. Uh, the powerful God of the universe, the God that is holy, the God that is righteous, the God that redeems us from sin, that cleanses us by the blood of his precious son. It's two gods. And he says right here, those last words, words six words, you cannot serve God in wealth. If there is a reminder for Americans today, that's it. Uh, my friend, I do have retirement accounts. I'm, I mean, I'm not ignorant. I believe you need to prepare for retirement. God's going to take care of you, but he gave you a brain to use, and you need to use it. 
I believe in preparation. But I also recognize that all of life is not in preparation for ourselves. All of life is not in position. All of life is not in occupation. All of life is not in prominence. All in life is not in the promises of men. Rather, it's in the providence of God. All of life is in God himself, and we serve him. We don't serve wealth. Uh, friend, I can tell you, I, have a, uh, I had an uncle. I was at his funeral uh, several, <clears throat> several months ago. He was a faithful man. Uh, he was a good man. Uh, everybody says that when you die. He was a good man. I don't care if you scum of the earth. I, I bet they're going to say that at my funeral. We don't know much about him, but he was a good man. Everybody says that. I've, never, I've, never, I've been to some funerals where they said he was a bad man, but not, they didn't say it too loudly. My uncle was a very wealthy man. He made the right decisions. He made some good business decisions. He started some good businesses. Motorola bought him out, and, well, he pretty well skated through life pretty well. Very successful man. Good man. Was very generous. Never knew he was a multimillionaire until shortly before he died. He died. I was at his funeral. I had the thought I was talking with a friend of mine who, uh, he was also a relative, which I didn't know he was my relative. He was one of those relatives you see only at the funerals. Uh, you, you have those relatives too. You didn't know you were kin until you start talking and find out that you were related. We were sitting there and we were talking and we said, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, everybody's going to end up at the front of the church one day. Uh, you know, it, it's as many funerals as I've been to, I, I, I continually have that reassuring thought. Uh, one day I'm not going to be here. I don't know when that's going to be. It might be tonight. Uh, it might be 300 years from now. If Jesus don't come back in the next 300 years, bless us. But I tell you, I remember sitting at his funeral a few months ago, and I looked at his casket, and I thought, you know how interesting it is. But for those who have made the right preparation, that's not the end. It's the beginning. Because our affections determine our Actions. Our actions determine our attitudes. You can't serve two masters. One master offers hope. One master offers money. There's nothing wrong with having money. People say, well, you know, the Bible says that, the, that money is the root of all evil. The Bible doesn't say that. The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. Nothing wrong with having money. There's a problem when you love it too much. There's a problem when you love fishing too much. There's a problem when you love your house too much. There even can be a problem when you love your family too much. There's some folks that may need to hear that. Anything that takes precedence over God, anything that has the wrong admiration, the wrong affection, the wrong action, and the wrong attitude produce a wrongful result. Actions determine our attitudes. In his sermon, The Writing on the Wall, William Willimon, he tells a story of an aggravating funeral at a country church. As I was reading it, it reminded me I've worked some funerals like this, and sometimes there are some insensitive preachers who preach funerals. And to be honest, they're not all that comforting. Uh, sometimes they say, well, they're in hell, there's no hope, but it's not too late for you. That's the wrong funeral message to preach. That's the wrong, uh, that's the wrong message to preach. I was at a funeral one time. I saw the pastor slap the casket and say, well, we know where he is, but it ain't too late for you. And I thought, boy, I wish I could push you in that hole about now. William Willimon told the story. He was at an aggravating funeral in this country. Preacher was pounding the pulpit. He looked over the casket. He would say, it's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to get his life together. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family. He might have wanted to do that, but he's dead now. It's too late for him. It's too late. He's got to see. He had a decision to make. And he began to be fiery and angry, and he was the classic fire and brimstone, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there is a time and a place, and that was not the time of the place. He began to condemn the man, and 
this man who was a preacher that had attended the funeral, he was driving home with his wife, and he was just infuriated. He said, how insensitive uh, could a preacher be? Uh, how, how, just, how ungodly uh, could a man be that would leave the family in such a state? And how manipulative and how insensitive and how disgusting. And his wife looked over to him and says, I've never heard anything like that. It was manipulative. It was disgusting. It was insensitive. But worst of all, it was also true. You know, the sad reality is that a lot of people walk through life and they never understand the key to impulsive behavior. They never understand the key to life, the key to sin, the key to forgiveness, the key to eternity. It's a one-letter word. And it's one word which America needs more than anything today. It's the word repentance. God can't do anything with a human unless they repent before God. God can't do anything with a preacher unless he repents and confesses before God. God can't do anything with a broken church unless they repent and confess before God. The sad reality is no one repents because too often they're serving the wrong God. They think they're serving the Lord and Savior of the world that we often like to proclaim the precious name of Jesus. But many people are enslaved to their own things that they admire, the things that they have affection towards, their pride, their ego, their position, their prominence. The question is, who do we serve? Who do we love? Who has the prominence? Because you'll never have victory over impulsive behavior until you straighten out just exactly who owns your life. Tracing the rainbow through the rain. Finding hope through life's problems. Finding victory and triumph over impulsive behavior. It starts with repentance. Coming before God. Realizing that there is hope. But the question has to be settled within the heart of everyone today. What is it that we serve? Our own desires? Our own life? our own way of thinking, the things we admire, our affections, our attitudes, our actions? Or is it God Almighty? Who is it that we serve? Those final words in verse 24. Man cannot serve God and mammon. Which God do you serve? Let's pray together. Father, we recognize that, um, that in life we have decisions. Every decision has a consequence, whether good or bad. But those decisions, those investments that we make in whatever life we lead and live. Uh, Father, we pray that our investments would be made wisely. That we would not lay up treasures in this life. But, Father, we lay up treasures in the life to come. Father, we do know that our affections determine a lot of our life. But, Father, may our affection be you. May our affection be your service, your commission, your gospel, your truth. Uh, Father, may our affection May our admiration, may it be that we stand in awe of you and who you are and what you've done. Uh, Father, we are faced with the decision daily. Who do we succumb to the flesh or do we experience victory over the, in the Spirit? Father, we pray that those who have gathered here tonight to worship you, Father, that their hearts would be made right with you Father, that they would make the right decisions, the right investments, recognizing that eternity is not something to be taken lightly, but something out of love you offer to those who repent, confess, and trust in you. Father, we pray that in this time of invitation, 
those who need to come would come. Father, that you give them boldness to respond to whatever you're impressing upon their hearts. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand, we sing, we're singing our closing hymn. Brother Randall's coming to lead us. If you need to come pray at the altar, the altar's open. If you want me to pray with you, we'd love to pray with you as Brother Randall leads us. Our hymn of invitation is number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Amen. All right. Well, yeah, it's great to be in the presence of the Lord. And uh, I tell you, I'm so grateful that you're here tonight. Uh, I do want to remind you of our evangelism emphasis, 23 and 23. We want to lead 23 people to Jesus in the year 2023. I think uh, that is certainly possible for our church. You'll notice located in the, I guess what we call it, the North X, the lobby, you'll notice a little table there by the window. Uh, there's some evangelistic material there uh, that can help you, maybe assist you in sharing the gospel. There will be uh, three things in that. One will be a gospel tract. You're welcome to take that, share it with someone. Uh, there's also something called the Jesus film. I believe it is in 23 or 25 different languages. Uh, it's a film that's been used to bring uh, thousands of people to Jesus Christ in many nations. And also there's some information about our church, a little contact card, uh, and things of the sort. You can take that. You can hang it on someone's door. Uh, or you can also... Uh, take the contents out of that out and hand it to someone. If you need some more gospel tracts or you want to say, hey, I want to be able to use those in my witnessing, uh, I've got plenty of them. Our church has plenty of them. Uh, you come see me or Linda Montgomery uh, or someone uh, that is over that, and we will certainly connect you with those materials. Uh, I believe that we can bring 23 people to Jesus if we'll pray and be faithful. Amen? Uh, you pray. This all I ask. This is your homework. It's all you have to do. Pray for one person you know is lost. I don't, I don't care if you say, well, I can't share the gospel. Well, just pray for them because God may bring someone along that can share the gospel with them. Uh, but you need to be doing that, and we'll, we'll talk about how you can do that. Bring up, We'll have a training here shortly. Uh, but God is going to work in that. God's going to bless that. But may we be faithful uh, to do what he asks us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask if he will. Uh, Brother Kenneth Clark, would you mind dismissing us in prayer tonight? Thank you.